Right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Hope you've had a good morning. Um, real pleasure to uh, be here and do this. I've been out pen painting fences this morning, so you can imagine I'm delighted to come and do this instead of uh, getting myself all uh, dirty in the garden. So, uh, right, I'm going to share the screen and bring this up. And hopefully this, yeah, that should work. So everybody can see that, which is great. Give me a, give me a, a you've, you've got your various, that's it. If you, if I get a thumbs up or you've always got to, some little um, gestures you can give on the screen at the bottom there if, if, if necessary. Right, uh, so uh, this is hopefully all about motivational practices, routines during the lockdown. Uh, and I've put this together especially for yourselves. Um, this is the first time I've done this particular um, topic, but I thought it would be something that uh, hopefully will get you talking. And you never know where these things lead and that every time they tend to be a little bit different. Oh, uh, my screen isn't moving. Ah, there we go. Good. Right. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. I'll, I'll briefly just tell you my background. Started playing at the age of 10 with the Bream Silver Band in the Forest of Dean. And it was my dad that sort of got me into trombone playing because he said I was rubbish at sport. And I'm actually really good at sport, but he didn't think so. Uh, moved to uh, another then Libra band about three years, four years later, age 14. And then went to Flowers Band, um, who I'm sure you've probably heard of. They're, they're a, a pretty decent band. Much better now than they were then, actually. So at 16, I moved um, to Flowers and then went on to Salford uh, when I was 18, 19. Um, and studied economics there, playing for Fairies Band. Um, some of the highlights were playing for the National Youth Band of Great Britain, doing solo contests in the north of England as well as the southwest of England, and doing things like the British Open Solo Competition. Sadly, a lot of these things aren't around, but I'll give you a bit of information about um, some that I'm aware of that some of the younger players might be interested in. Uh, moved back down to Gloucestershire for a few years and then moved back up to Cheshire in 2000. So I've been here over 20 years now uh, in this in this area of the country. And um, that was to study at the RNCM to do a, a diploma there, a performance diploma, then went on and did a master's. And that's what got me into Salford teaching is that I did a master's there and then a, a doctorate in performance. Um, and uh, I was the one moaning about the course. So they said, well, you run it then. And so that's how I got into that. Uh, so what have I been doing? Uh, so I've played for Black Dyke over the last 20 years, trustee of the National Youth Brass Band of Great Britain, and uh, also trustee of Uni Brass Organisation, which um, I must admit I've learnt more from them, certainly than me giving advice to, to these younger people. It's been uh, a, a joy and, and an eye-opener for me in terms of how they use technology. Uh, I was chairman and president of the British Trombone Society, and I'm now chair of the research committee of the International Trombone Association. So we're looking at putting together papers for people, but from a practical point of view, rather than it being too academic. Uh, I've taught as a classroom teacher before doing my master's. Um, and then I was program leader at Salford for about uh, seven or eight years, finishing that in 2019. Um, I teach around 30 private students on Zoom and Skype um, and in, certainly enjoyed the tutoring that I did until recently, because that's all dried up as of uh, the last 12 months, but th whether it be the National Youth Brass Band, the Children's Band, and of course, uh, the National Youth Band of Scotland, um, which has been uh, a real privilege to do over the last couple of years. Okay, right. Uh, so we're gonna get on to the, the sort of main topic of today, and that's talking about trying to motivate you to think about practice, think about what you're doing and what you're not doing and how we can maybe help you with that. So um, it's very important to develop habits. Habits can be good things, they can also be bad things. So what do I mean by uh, developing habits? So for instance, try and practice somewhere where you're not gonna get disturbed. Now that might be, um, it might be a, a bedroom, it might be the kitchen. It just needs to be somewhere where you know you can have at least half an hour where um, you're not you're not going to get troubled and also try and make sure your phone's off as well because uh, I know I'm terrible for it if I don't have the phone in a different room I'm going to want to look at it so I've got to the stage now where I've got my own practice room um, and that's what I tend to do and these things might seem obvious but there's such a temptation to have to set everything up each time for practice and then you, you're not spending your half hour practicing, you're spending five minutes getting set up, five minutes then breaking things down and set and, and getting stuff back to 
the normal. So try and find a room um, that you can do uh, things on a regular basis in a room that you won't get disturbed. Have the instrument and music out and ready beforehand. I remember uh, a story about Morris Murphy who used to have a trumpet on uh, in every room and every corner of the room. So he would just pick one up as he went through and uh, practice um, in different different instruments in different rooms. And often when the adverts were on so that he'd be watching telly and then he'd pick it up and have a bit of a play during the adverts. So if you've got instruments in the way, you're more likely to want to pick them up and then practice them or even move them out of the way. But it's an incentive then. You, if, if something's looking at you, instrument wise you're going to think oh do you know what i should pick that up and, and practice it so actually the visual is uh, is very important to getting you to think about right i should go and practice for five minutes even if it is only five minutes that you get and then the other thing i've put is to think about soundproofing and the position of the room that you play in so what i've found is very useful is actually playing into curtains because it does deaden the sound and make it a little bit more difficult which is not a bad thing and I've also found playing into uh, beds or sofas, anything that's uh, going to give a cushioning effect and is going to deaden the sound is good because when you do then eventually get back into um, a band room situation where you're practicing uh, in, in a nice acoustic, it's going to seem such a joy and such a nice thing to do. And I would advise you to try and make it as difficult as possible to play in the room that you play in. For some people that can be um, quite literally the, the cupboard under the stairs where you practice, where people have soundproofed just that area. It could be a storeroom that you've got. It could be, um, what I'm saying is, try not to play in good acoustics, like the kitchen is normally quite a good acoustic because anything that's shiny is gonna give you a good sound. And so you wanna try and avoid that. Uh, in a practicing sense and I know people will put egg boxes on the roof and all that sort of thing you don't need to do that you just need to maybe put some decorative um, uh, mats or, or, or carpets in a certain place in the room so it doesn't get in the way and it doesn't look bad um, and then play in a corner of the room and I find that really useful I, I've, I've had this uh, I've, I've moved house recently and I don't know if you can see but I've, I've got things set up now and I've actually got carpet underneath all the filing cabinets that are there because that will deaden the sound I've got carpet on top of any surface um, the only thing I do need to do but it's it's work in progress is I've got some filing cabinets there I normally put drapes down over them so that it again it deadens the sound and I don't get a reflection off off any uh, reflective surfaces so that um, I mean yes of course I'm, I'm really uh, obsessed with these things and I'm not suggesting you need to go to that nth degree but just so you're aware it does make a difference if you can deaden things and put um, bits of carpet um, to have to mention that uh, that terrible name Black Dyke between um, uh, the, the, the carpet is very thick upstairs where the band used to practice but also all the um, all the uh, whether it be um, photos or whether it be cups, they've all got carpet behind them and there's carpet actually underneath the chairs so that um, a certain B-flat bass player used to own a carpet shop actually kitted out the whole room and deadened it off by putting carpet everywhere possible in, in the room and that, that makes a big difference and I'm sure that's part of the reason why um, it's, it's quite a challenge to play in the band room. Okay, uh, potential problems. Uh, problems that I find are, f uh, f are literally finding time to practice. That's not been such an issue during lockdown, I must admit. But in normal circumstances, it is finding um, an appropriate time to practice and an optimum time to practice. Um, so I would always suggest trying to find a time of the day when it's going to be best for you to play. When your concentration levels are high. Um, so, for instance, if it's when you get back from work, that maybe is not a good time uh, to play. But the other thing I've, I've found um, is that actually it does help with the stress levels, just going into a practice room and then forgetting about all the stuff that's going on and then just playing and going through the routines that I need to do, which I'll talk about uh, a bit later, depending on the, the questions we get. So finding time to practice, yes, is, is, is very important. And I've found that if I do st sort of state a particular time whether it be six o'clock in the evening whether it's eight o'clock in the morning to have a quick 10 minute warm-up if i forced myself just to get into that routine of doing it i don't i don't think about it then i just think okay it's this time and now i'll go and practice and, and that makes a big difference for me actually um much more difficult when i'm traveling around the country and around different different uh, areas and, and on on the motorway a lot but certainly 
due to lockdown, I've been able to really get into some routines and that's that's helped a lot. Knowing what to practice. So I've, I've, later on, I'll talk about some books um, that are very useful. And, and as a result of teaching a lot of valve players and being taught mainly by valve players, I, I didn't really have uh, until going and, and doing a, a master's, I didn't really have a trombone teacher uh, as a tutor. It was um, euphonium players and cornet players. So a lot of the books that I have are um, really for valve instruments, but are very effective for the trombone. So I'll mention some of those um, uh, don't tell him, but I've got pretty much most of Dave King's uh, study books here um, that, that I can sort of um, give you information on. Um, knowing when to practice. So we've talked a little bit about that. Knowing when to stop and rest. So that is really important. If you do start feeling tired, and I don't always mean tired in terms of your lips, but tired in terms of your brain, because if you're not actively involved in what you're doing when you're practicing if you're not thinking about practice whilst you're practicing if you're not thinking about the piece and the music involved in the piece then you probably need to have five minutes rest um go and make a cup of tea go and have a walk around uh the, a different room then come back to it and you'll find when if you're refreshed like that and just have five minutes off you're far more engaged and you're far able to pick up um things like tuning, things like coordination, uh, rhythmic uh, pulse, that sort of thing. And if you are tired and you're practicing, that's that's not a great situation to be in because you start to accept things and you start to sort of get a little bit complacent. So it is important to know when you've done too much and you need to have a bit of a rest. Then the other thing, of course, is to focus on um, not focus on just one aspect of playing. So if it's high notes you're thinking of, don't think that, right, I've got to just practice high notes all the time. It doesn't work like that. You've got to practice lots of different aspects of playing. Um, so that's something, again, that uh, I found really, really important is to look at lots of different aspects within the hour of, uh, of which I'm playing rather than try and focus on one particular thing. And they all then play off each other and uh, complement each other. Okay, uh, healthy habits. So uh, what I tend to find is that in each rehearsal or practice that I do, I try and have a goal in mind. So it could be a very trivial goal. It could be working on a piece of music or it could be I want to get that super G and I want it to sound really, really nice and open. Um, I've put there record your performance of a piece at the end of the session and also to collaborate with others to produce a duet, for instance. So you could play a track and then you could send that to somebody via email or via WhatsApp and then they could uh, layer that and then they could send it back to you. So have some collaboration going um, within these times where it's more difficult to uh, actually get together in a band room situation. And then I've also put down why not enter an online competition. So, for instance, there's a Philip McCann cornet competition going on um, over the next few months. I think the deadline is the end of March, I think 24th of March, something like that. Um, and there's also the Yorkshire Open, which is another slow melody competition that's open to university students uh, 18 and under. And I think there's then an open section. And with the Philip McCann contest, there's also three different sections, which I think are quite similar. Um, but that's open. Um, the Yorkshire Open is open to any instrument whilst the Philip McCann competition is particularly for cornet players for slow melody playing. So uh, I'd very much advise you have a look on Facebook and just ha have a look at the application forms on there and go for something like this. The first part of the competition in both cases is where you record something and send that in. Um, and then hopefully if restrictions allow the second part of that for then the final for the top three who get through from each round, each, each section will then get to play in a, um, an actual live performance um, against each other. So you've got nothing to lose by entering the um, the video section for sure and getting some um, feedback from some uh, really good people. I should say that uh, it's myself and Johnny Bates that are uh, adjudicating the Yorkshire Open. So, uh, but then Philip McCann and Kirsty Abbotts are doing the uh, Philip McCann competition. Right, I'm just going to stop sharing the screen a second just so I can look at some people and pick on them Holly's there hello Holly um, so tell me Holly what would you do in terms of um, if we're thinking about practice routines what would you say is a reasonable amount of time to practice um so I normally do mine maybe twice a day I normally do about 45 minutes per session 
All right, yeah. That well, um, there's quite a few studies out. So during my uh, time in academia, there's a number of studies that sort of mention that it, it's no coincidence that lessons at school are normally either fifty minutes or an hour, and quite often meetings are, uh, are an hour or half an hour, um, and that's because most people can only concentrate for about 20 minutes before yeah. they then start thinking about other things. So yeah. uh, I think a, a 40 minute session is good because you can split that easily into two parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about a warm up? Would you do that beforehand? And how long would you spend on that? Um, no, I would normally do a warm up and then take a short break. But for my warm up, I would normally do things like long notes or maybe a study in the urban tutor. I use that quite often. Hmm. And I'm going to talk a bit later about some of the books uh, yeah. that, that I would recommend, uh, both for whether it be for valve players. Um, I was lucky to get taught by the likes of um, David King. And so I used to use a lot of his corner study books and um, he never made any allowances about the fact that I was a trombone player. Yeah. yeah so that was good from my point of view because it really pushed me. Um, but no, I think I think that's what you've said there is really important and there's even a, another book that would suggest that you play for 10 minutes on and then 10 minutes off and then 10 minutes on and then 10 minutes off and that that just like uh, any training sessions is uh, a, a, a something to think about in terms of practice so that you are really then thinking about what it is you're doing rather than it just being um, something that you're not engaged and involved in all the time because if you've got to play solid I mean I don't think it, even in a rehearsal if you think about it you're probably putting the instrument on your lap more times than you are playing because the conductor will be instructing and then another part of the band will be playing and things like that. So it's very rare that we would get to play solidly for 40 minutes. So it's thinking about that sort of thing. That that was brilliant answer, Holly. So you're off the hook now. I'm going to ask somebody else. Thanks. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Louise, uh, Louise, what, what about yourself? How long would you practice for and why? <laughs> Um, so how long? Um, so I suppose it just depends. Um, so obviously like I'm working normally full time and I've got two young kids. So I usually try to time it when they're maybe going like in their bath. So my husband can sort them out and I'll practice while um, he's sort of doing that. So it does tend to be maybe later in the evening. But again, I would normally try and I would try and do it maybe for like around about an hour, I guess. Um, and I will try and do it most days. Um, but I think I think I would just be interested to sort of hear the, the right things to practice, and because I, I think right now I'm just a bit bored. Like I've kind of used I've used like most of the music that I've I've kind of uh, borrowed from the the band hall, and uh, so it'd be nice to see what what I'm supposed to do. So like I do what I think is right, but it might not actually be the right thing. Yeah, no, I I think uh, and and this has been something that's come up time and time again. Um, in the sessions that, that I've been doing. And, but also it's been my own battle really in that, uh, I mean, for here now we're in lockdown number three. And so the first lockdown was actually great because it meant that I could get out quite a few of these really tricky concertos that I've never had the time to practice and work on them and listen to recordings. So I'd go on YouTube or I'd have a CD and I'd listen to it. And I had the time to actually go through and practice those pieces that were always um and it, it wasn't aspirational in terms of they were too tricky for me but i just never had the time to be able to look through all that sort of stuff so um and when i say have the time it, often I, i've been doing some classroom teaching um and then but the fact that i've not gone to band in the evening i've had uh, the hour that I travel to band plus the two hours plus the hour back so I had four hours each evening twice a week where I thought this is a luxury I'm going to try and make use of that time um, so what I found really useful is that um, I've I've actually bought a number of different study books so whereas I would normally go to my favorites like whether it be the Herbert Clark or whether it be the Coprash what I've done is I've actually gone onto eBay and bought for a couple of pounds some really obscure books that, I, that some have been terrible but the vast majority have actually been very good because a lot of a lot of if people have bought a book it's normally by recommendation so if you get it second hand it probably is pretty good because you know the, the ones that are rubbish end up staying on the shelf in the shop and so i bought a couple of these books for next to nothing and gone through them and what i what 
I tended to do, and I found that I've, I've, because I've got more time, I'm not doing, is that I'd look at all the ones in the flat keys and I go through those and I try them. But as soon as I get one in five sharps, it's like, right, I'll go to the next one. So I've made a point of not doing that. And whenever one comes up and there's two sharps, three sharps, five sharps, whatever it is, I just have a go at it. And th they are always more difficult. We don't tend to, as brass band players, play in a lot of sharps. That's why it's good for us to do it. Um, and so then what I found is that actually for myself, and it, it'll be the same for the majority of brass players, is that um, books written for violin players and saxophone players and flute players are a real challenge, but really good to do. So I've then been going on to eBay and I've been looking for books that are written, study books for other instruments, whatever it might be. Um, good ones are, are saxophone, oboe, uh, cello. They work really well for my instrument and will probably work for most valve instruments really well. And so whereas on lockdown one and two, I'd pretty much exhausted all my repertoire. I've now had a situation where I've got some other things. And I've also uh, used the fact that when you're on YouTube and you watch something and it's something you're aware of, it normally brings up, oh, because you were interested in this, there's a list of other things. And I have found quite a bit of repertoire as unaware of um, that I've then um, tried to find. And, and I'm amazed at how much repertoire is free online now. So if any of you have not got the online free Arben, then shame on you because it's really expensive to buy and it breaks your, your music stand. So it's maybe good to um, pick up that one and start working. I, I'm not a big fan of the Arben, but there are a good 40 pages in there which are invaluable. And so if you haven't got it, then just go and get the online version and print off the, the really useful pages in it and it'll, it'll save you a lot of effort rifling through trying to find the right stuff. So no, great answer, Louise. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to, um, Brett, um, Brett. Yes. It, hi, it's Fiona. I'm glad you brought up other instruments. Um, yeah. So I'm a tenor horn player and, and I've been playing a lot of alto sax stuff during um, lockdown and, and you get a much bigger range when you when you go and look at music for, for some other instruments as well. So it's, it's kind of a handy thing to do, particularly on YouTube. There's lots of play along stuff and that makes your practice in your house a, a little bit more enjoyable when you get some backing tracks as well Th that's right and uh since you've mentioned that fiona there's also um you might not be aware of these you might be there's the music minus one series and so for trombones there's i mean a lot of people will use the trumpet ones and so they'll work for a lot of the valve instruments pretty well um i've got a couple that are bass trombone specific really rather than tenor trombone but the thing is you've got a full symphony orchestra or swing band that you can uh, at your disposal that you can then listen to and then play along with and so uh, again that's something which normally I just wouldn't get the time or the patience to do but I've, I've been doing that um, I've set up now that I've got um, a CD player and I've actually got a, I bought myself a vinyl um, player as well what do they call these things What's a vinyl player called? You know what I mean? See, I never used one in the past. A record player. A record player, yeah. <laughs> so I bought myself one of those um, just so that I'd have the opportunity to listen to some really obscure old pieces that aren't available on CD and they're not on YouTube. Um, there's quite a lot of, for me, uh, whether it be Don Lusher pieces and uh, James Shepard playing um, pieces with, with bands that, that I've managed to listen to. Um, so that's been really useful as well. So no, that's a, a, a really good point. And you write about the range scenario and bear in mind that working on your lower range. So for instance, if you're thinking, okay, well, I've only got three valves on a tenor horn um, and I want to get the notes lower than F sharp, then it forces you to have to play yep. both lower as well as higher. And, and that's, much higher. <laughs> And, and that's great for your high register to practice yeah. the low stuff as well, because you, you have to reset the embouchure. You have to think about what you're doing. Um, and then if we get time, I'll talk a little bit about the Claude Gordon book, which actually guides you towards doing that. And so a good way of doing it is, as you say, to, to buy, whether it be, um, dare I say the word, French horn, saxophone, <laughs> uh, clarinet books, those sort of things, because they yeah. they really do stretch you from a range point of view. Fully. Yeah. Good. OK, uh, right. I'll bring up the um, presentation again.
There we are. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about um, the, the competitions that, that are around, and certainly it's worth having a look at those. All right, there we go. Right, we've, we've touched on this a little bit, but uh, why warm-up? Um, the, the thing to think about with warm-ups is actually it's not about physically warming the instrument up. It's about warming your brain up. That's how I would think about it. So, yes, you have to warm your embouchure up, but in effect... Playing an instrument is about um, coordination. And so if you don't warm your brain up, how can you coordinate all the different aspects of getting the fingers to work, getting the lips to work, getting the tongue to work, breathing, posture? All these aspects are really important as a brass player and as a percussionist. Um, so it's worth thinking about making sure that warm-up is getting yourself ready to play. So if we look about at how long that should take, and let's see if I can... Uh, pick on somebody else. Hang on a minute. Great. Let's have a look. Yeah, let's ask Jim. Jim, what what do you think? Um, how how long should you warm up for? Do you think? To say, I don't warm up for very long at all. I I agree with you. That that's that's actually my my philosophy in life. Uh, so no, I I don't I take, but then. Perhaps it's because people that play regularly all the time, you don't need to warm up that much because you're already playing all the time. So your lips and your breathing, everything's going to get to the stage in which it's ready very quickly. If you're having days off, weekends off, things like that, that's when you need to warm up more. And that's understandable. Just like, um, believe it or not, I run every day now. And if I have a day off, don't I ever feel it? Well, you'll know that from you. You've you've, you've had the the unfortunate uh, um, position of watching me go for a run in the morning, Jim. So apologies. Yes, for I that. have that. <laughs> but uh, so it's about getting yourself ready. And if you are ready, then it, it can take thirty seconds, two minutes. Um, my old teacher, Chris Holding, used to maintain that he would take an hour to warm up which I just, I, I couldn't comprehend it, but it's because he, he, he goes through all these different routines and exercises to get himself ready. To, and he's all right. He, at the time he was a professional player and uh, probably had quite a bit of time on his hands playing in the opera because they don't get to play much in the opera uh, on trombone. But yeah, I, I, that for me was just overkill. So it takes as long as it takes. I think that's the best way to approach it. And everybody's going to be different and that's fine. Um, I've put down call and response because what I tend to do in my lessons these days, um, it's very difficult, as I'm sure some of you will have experienced, trying to do a rehearsal online, trying to play with each other. It's a disaster because of all the different bandwidths and all that sort of thing. But what you can do quite effectively is a call and response. So you play something and you make it up on the spot and it could be a lip slur exercise, it could be a scale, and then the person that's the other side of Zoom or Skype or whatever you're using then has to play the same thing. And then they play something and then you've got to then reciprocate and play what they played. And that way it really gets you thinking about pitch, about the muscles that you're using, about how pitch and uh, how, how your... Um, muscles react to what you're listening to and then when you're copying it you might say for instance they might start on a g and you're thinking okay that's quite a high note and then you play an e and you think okay right that's not high enough it's actually really useful from a um, a pitch point of view and just muscle memory point of view so you, it's something you might want to try and it can be once you get used to it quite fun it, it's it's a little bit awkward to start off with but i've used it in all my lessons now where the the warm-up is me playing something three notes they play three notes i play another three notes then i start playing uh two bars worth of something and of course the difficult thing then is not playing the notes it's remembering what somebody's played and it's and, and that's really good for you as well uh, they're saying that during lockdown um the the first thing to go is memory and so it's one way in which you can discipline yourself to then start getting your memory to work properly again so and recall is very very important as a, as a as a musician so that's something you could try um and then i've also put on their warm downs so a warm down particularly if you're going to start playing for longer periods of time or 
if we look at the fact that at some point, whether it's March or June or September, whenever it is that we do get back into the band rooms, we're all going to be uh, we're all going to want to play for a long period of time. And we're probably going to do too much. We're probably going to play too loud. We're going to do all the things that we've been uh, really patient and not doing during lockdown. So I just want to uh, mention that and get you to think about trying to think about it like you would run a marathon. So when you do get back into band rooms, A, start building yourself up for that type of activity. So practice playing loud, practice playing long notes, practice playing quiet. Those are the things we don't do at home because we do them in the band room. Everybody's blowing their heads off in the band room when they've got fortissimo and, and working really hard at the pianos, but it's not something that we'll practice. So practice it, it'll make a big, big difference. What should we practice? Okay, um, so this is the bit I was alluding to in that a lot of the time, if it's double tonguing that we want to master, that we just keep practicing double tonguing. And it doesn't work like that. You've got to practice a lot of different aspects of playing for things to work properly and for all the different aspects of playing to, to come together and work for you. Um, so you can see the observant ones amongst you will see that that spells my name and there's two T's in my name. So the B... Um, is for breathing and actually I would suggest that you do think about practicing breathing I know it seems really odd but it's an important aspect of uh, if not the most important aspect of what we do as brass players and even as a percussionist you need to breathe with the brass so that you don't come in early so you need to learn to breathe um, and I would suggest that the vast majority of us we don't breathe in what I would call an optimum and efficient way. We breathe and we breathe rather well, but we don't do it properly. What is breathing properly? Breathing properly is not tensing your body up when you breathe. And so that's what a lot of us do. Sometimes it's subconscious. And what I suggest to a lot of my students is that, and this sounds weird, but if you think about it, it will work. Try and relax your toes, because if you can relax your toes, you can relax your feet, you can relax your legs, you can relax relax the whole of your body and then you take a breath in and then if you're struggling with um, breathing in and tensing up at the same time which is perfectly natural uh, it sort of relates to the fight or flight uh, uh, response which I, again I can talk about if we get time um, and so when you breathe in if you're finding that's difficult and you're tensing up when you breathe in breathe in through your nose breathe in slowly through your nose out through your mouth and then take a breath in through your mouth and you'll find it's a different sensation and you're using your lungs in a different way and that hopefully should help you um that there's there's a book by a trumpet player called malta berber and malta, malta berber is a german uh, physiologist who talks about different aspects of playing and is really red hot on the fact that you need to think about physically what you're doing uh, not just playing wise but breathing in if you breathe in in an open and relaxed way that the air and the result of the note that you play is going to be more open and relaxed and, and natural. So that's that's a really important aspect. So think about the breathing. Uh, R is for, and this is this is a little bit lame, I realise, but R is for um, rehearsing. And so what I mean by rehearsing um, is uh, thinking about what you're doing and putting a plan of action together. So uh, we've talked about warm ups. Um, then I would suggest that we think about um, actually doing a, a couple of lip flexibility exercises again, which gets you sort of from the warm up stage to the ready to play stage. Nothing above uh, middle C, I would advise. You think in low C to middle C and that's the range you should be warming up in. Then you start practicing lip, lip flexibilities where you can go a little bit higher uh, and a little bit lower. And uh, even playing low notes loud when you're warming up can can be uh, potentially damaging so you need to think about breaking yourself in over that 30 seconds that two minutes that you're warming up then think about the dreaded scales and uh, I, I admit I hate playing scales but they are very very useful and what they do is they make you understand patterns in music the building blocks of music much much easier so even though I don't enjoy playing scales I will do them and I will pack and the way I get around it is I practice studies based on scales. 
So rather than necessarily always playing the scales through and, and it can be a bit boring, I'll get a study book that actually goes through the different scales. Uh, and there's many of them, whether it be the Herbert Clark characteristic studies, whether it be uh, the Arban, whether it's the Coprash, whether it's the uh, Vizzuti books, the Alan Vizzuti books, all of them have got um, exercises in there in different keys. So that that's how you can get around that problem. Um, so also in, in the rehearsal, um, think about all the different things that you can't do. It's no good practicing the things you can play because that's not practice, that's performance. So you perform the things you're good at, you practice the things that you're not so good at. So that's where it could be high register, it could be flexibility, it could be slow melody practice, it could be long note practice, um, it could be um, staccato playing, piano playing, all those things build into your practice and uh, be sort of methodical about it and write down the 10 things that you're going to work on every single time you play and that way you can't go wrong and they only need to take a couple of minutes each time so you can be through a lot of those 10 aspects of playing in 20 minutes to leave you then to actually practice pieces whether it be uh, cadenzas from test pieces <laughs> if you're into that sort of thing I certainly am not um, or whether it be slow melodies that you like playing or whether it be florids or whether it be um, hymn tunes whatever it is that you then enjoy playing you can leave that for the last sort of 15 minutes of your practice I've got a question here um, to me saying motivation has been an issue for many people um, without the usual round of concerts and competitions uh, totally agree. How have players in Black Dyke found the past few months? Have they appreciated the break from the busy schedule? Um, everybody's different, just like uh, you, you can imagine that there's some people that are absolutely raring to go and can't wait to get back into the band room. Um, myself, I've uh, never had it so good because the journey to band was always horrendous. It was going on the M62 motorway, which was always busy. I was always stuck in traffic, so quite often it would take me two hours to get to a band rehearsal and then an hour and 20 to get home. And then if you can imagine if I got there and then the rehearsal was only 20 minutes, I was furious because I've driven all that way to then do a 20 minute rehearsal for a recording the next week. I'm not impressed. So I've actually um, used the time wisely. I know some people um, uh, have, have like me have, have enjoyed the rest because we were out every weekend we were doing about two and a half gigs on average a week and so that's been good um, I suppose that the sad thing really is that there would be only a handful of players M most players in Black Dyke have uh, proper jobs as well they do other things whether they're a solicitor whether they're a classroom teacher whether they're a university professor they'll all have other jobs but there's going to be a small proportion of the band, uh, some of the soloists, their sole income would have been from concerts. Some of them uh, uh, would have been students or have just finished as students. Their sole income would have been concerts and uh, teaching and solo gigs and things like that. And they've really found it difficult. So people that do a lot of different things. So I, I now work for Geneva, which is a company um, that makes musical instruments. But I also teach privately and I also do workshops and I do some tutorials and I also do some arrangements and I've been busy doing quite a bit of that. I've been furloughed since, uh, it feels like time began, but for nearly a year now, I've been furloughed since the, the areas, so um, the end of March, right through till now. And so that's why I've been doing some, uh, I'm still teaching at uh, University of Salford, I'm teaching the trombone players there. But I'm also doing classroom teaching, and this will make some of you laugh, but I've been teaching PE, geography, English, uh, technology. I had to do a knitting class, for goodness sake. Can you imagine what I was like trying to show these kids how to make something out of... Anyway, So, I, but I've really enjoyed it. It's been uh, an eye-opener for me, and I actually have really appreciated the time. I, I moved house a couple of weeks ago. I would never have had the time. Uh, and it's such a stressful thing to do. And if, if I wasn't on lockdown, I, I don't think I would have managed it. So it's actually for me, um, I can't say it's been good because I wouldn't wish it on anybody to have uh, COVID and I wouldn't wish, wish the lockdown on anybody because it's just not, it's a frustrating time. But for me, I, I've managed to use the time really wisely. And I've done a lot of things that, I just wouldn't have had the time to do, whether it be painting various walls in the house, whether it be 
um, sorting out. Um, I've got a, a cabin on a, a piece of land in Gloucestershire because I, I own a bit of ground along with my sister and brother. And uh, in between lockdowns, I've been spending a lot of time down there doing, um, uh, getting the place tidied up basically, and it's almost ready for people to visit. Anyway, back to the what we should practice. I dive, I digress. Uh, e is for embouchure. And so in terms of embouchure, it's lip flexibility exercises. It's thinking about what the front of the tongue is doing, the tip of the tongue, but also the back of the tongue. E sounds and the tongue going high in the mouth allows you to play high notes. O sounds allow you to play low notes. And in terms of um, embouchure and then the next one, tonguing, T for tonguing, I would think about using different syllables for practicing different things. So if you're playing, uh, if you want to use a soft tongue, think about na so the n the n syllable na think about ba think about ta for accents think about da the d tongue for an all purpose note and using different syllables can actually be really useful to give you variety in terms of playing um and particularly if you're trying to um show the words in a piece of music that you're portraying using different syllables can allow you to create that so you don't always physically uh, manifest the syllable that I'm saying when you play but if you think a certain syllable it will produce a different type of articulation which is going to give you variety hopefully that makes sense and again I'm happy to take questions on that if if uh, if need be and, and then the last T is turbulence which again I know is a little bit far-fetched but what I'm saying is keep the air going through the instrument at all times keep the air the turbulence there supporting each note that you play and that's going to allow a big nice open uh, round sound oh this thing's uh, stop working again excuse me a minute ah there we go right um so we've we've talked about how long we should practice in terms of time several books that i can recommend for valve players the album but which bits so i'm saying the octave jump exercises in the album are really good the scalic exercises are really good and the uh, rhythmic exercises from about page 30 sad that i remember all this but from about page 30 to page 40 very very good all those rhythmic exercises with the jumps i find very useful and then of course the solos in the back of the book are very good as well in terms of herbert clark several books i'd recommend the characteristic studies uh are just i think they're excellent so that certainly there's also a 24 studies by herbert clark which are good and then there's uh, i think they're called vocal studies not so well known but there's a, a book on that as well and any study books that uh, say that they're vocal studies are really worth buying because they show off the lyrical side of your playing and get you to think about the lyrical side of technical play um, for lower brass players the Coprash and the Dave Vining book so if you're a tuba player or a bass trombone player they would be very valuable but bear in mind they're in bass clef so if you don't read bass clef stick to the trumpet version of the Coprash for lower brass because that will allow you to then work on those exercises excuse me for absolutely everybody I'd recommend the Alan Vazuti books there's three of them and they're fabulous uh, the studies in them are really interesting um, if you're a trombone player, there's a book called, uh, strangely enough, How Trombone Players Do It by Peter Gang and Eric Kreese. Fabulous book, explains things very well. And then again, for everyone, I would think about a book called The Art of Practice by Howard Snell. Fabulous book, not very long. Uh, it's, it's not got many pages in it, not that expensive. Uh, there's another book that he wrote called The Trumpet, which is a bit more expensive and a bit more um, detailed. But that is a book that I'd advise everybody to get. It's very, very useful several methods so there's a difference between maybe study books and methods uh, a method is where it's basically their philosophy of playing um, charles collins book on lip flexibilities is very very good there's a treble clef and there's a bass clef one um, what that will do is it will build up stamina it will build up your high range it will build up your uh, moving from one note to the next your flexibility paul archibald's books called breathe are very good if you can get hold of them uh, but they're a precursor then to another book called The Systematic Approach to Brass Playing by Claude Gordon. By the way, I've sent all these uh, slides to uh, John. So John can send this out to everybody or people that ask for it, if, if you like. The Claude Gordon book, uh, I would advise if you're going to use it to do it 
with a teacher to have a teacher that knows the book and to work through aspects of it because otherwise you could do your lips and damage there are some kamikaze studies in the claude gordon and if you don't know what you're doing it it can it can ruin you let's say from a lip point of view so i would not touch it unless you've got somebody that can give you the right approach and show you how to work even if it was like a couple of introductory sessions on it and then you might find it very useful but it's uh it's a beast of a book and it's it's um, difficult okay here's some more books on general playing and confidence which again during lockdown um it's been uh, certainly i've had time to go through these again and reread them the perfect wrong note by wesley is, is a great book in terms of just getting you to think differently about your playing, about pressure and about contests and things like that. Preparation, Practice and Performance by uh, Roger Webster. That is an excellent book um, and a lot of it's borrowed, but it's it's worded really well. Um, so that's worth looking at. Brass Masterclass by Malta Berber, I talked about earlier. Tensions in the Performance of Music by Carol Agrindia. Uh, Blink, that's got one chapter in there about the psychology of music if, if you're interested in getting it getting it and then the inner game of music just like the inner game of tennis and there's another one called the inner game of golf or something like that but there's one on music which is very good and this one's i know a little bit left field but it's called the chimp paradox and it's all about how your brain works and the fact that there's a primitive part of your brain and there's the humanistic part of your brain and when we start getting anxious and fearful it's the primitive part of our brain that takes over and is very powerful and gets us doing things we don't want it to do. So it's all the things that happen in fight and flight um, when you're getting nervous on stage. That explains it really well. And I think you'll know yourself a lot better if you read a book like The Chimp Paradox. So um, performance tips. Um, well, I've now got an option of talking about any of these, but I'm going to open it up so I give people time to um, ask some questions. So let's just stop sharing the screen a minute and see if anybody's got any questions. I know yeah. this is high octane stuff and I go 100 mile an hour, so I apologize for that, but I'd like to get as much in as I can. Somebody was going to speak, sorry. Wait, I was going to ask. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. All right. I was going to ask, usually I mute to practice because you get practice mutes. And if so, what's the day for mute? Because I've got a straight mute, cut mute. I, do, I used to do a lot of practice with a mute just to get all those little build up and things like that. That's the first question. Yeah. Um, it, it diff <laughs> like, uh, this sounds a bit of a cop out, but I've tried this with different mutes. And what I tend to find is that the cheaper mutes, uh, I'm not going to mention a certain. <laughs> Dennis Witt, um, tend to not be as good um, as perhaps the human Berg mutes and the Joe Rell mutes and things like that. So what type of mute you use can make a big difference. I found that the Yamaha practice mutes, the, the silent brass ones, aren't very good. They're good short term. And if you use them like with most things, if you do a little bit of practice with the mute, it's beneficial. But if you do all the practice with your mute, then the muscles start to get to the stage where they get used to the mute being in just like when you change mouthpiece and then your muscles get used to it and what happens is over time then you find find that your sound starts to uh alter and that when you're not then using the mute it gets a bit grainy so i would suggest yes it is good to use a mute it's good to use a practice mute but to do it uh as part of practice but not to practice with them all the time because i found with the silent mute I actually bruised the bottom of my lip. So it wasn't the top part of the lip that was an issue. It was the bottom part of the lip was bruising as a result of playing differently from trying to project and getting the sound I wanted on the um, Yamaha mute. So I don't use those anymore. Mm -hmm. I actually use, um, can I find it? Because I've moved house, I can't find anything now. Hang on a sec, let's see uh, if I can see it. Uh, it's one of those uh, little mutes that go flush into the bell um, they're made by uh, a Japanese company, I think called Br Brass Fix. And so I found that they're the best practice mutes to use. Um, the Dennis Wick ones are basically a, a, a tin mute with some holes drilled into mm. it and painted black. So that, you know, you can just do that yourself if you want. Uh, and I've known people get plastic um, 
bot uh, bottles, whether it be a water bottle, and actually use them uh, and put a cloth in it and practice with those um, again to help with uh, stamina and work with breathing. But um, the short answer is use the mute and practice with it, but try not to do it all the time. And I get guess that it's probably right. because you right, a bucket mute. Yeah, but, um, a, 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 that's right. And the bucket mutes are probably a little bit more dull, so they're not going to project as well. And you're going to play that differently to perhaps a straight mute. Um, but I think if you're going to practice with a mute, it's worth getting a very good practice mute, if that makes sense. Brett, can I just uh, jump in here? Um, we're, we're rapidly running out of time. Um, we could listen to you definitely all day. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's brilliant to hear to hear you talk about ways to get around our practice and lockdown and actually to see it in the slides, which I'll make available for everyone. It just encourages you to take your instrument out. So thank you for that. Um, Carrie came up with a great idea for a new workshop, though after listening to you talking about your teaching duties. So we're now going to have one called Saba Knits with Dr. Brett Baker. So <laughs> if, that's, if that's all right, we'll arrange that for, for some time in the future. <laughs> Yeah, you wouldn't want to see what I was knitting. It was dreadful, <laughs> honestly. Brett, Brett, thank you so much. And to everyone, I hope, oh, you, I hope you enjoyed the session. And um, we'll see you soon, Brett. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And uh, best of luck to everybody. Hopefully see you all in the flesh sometime soon. Thank you. All right. Bye for now. Bye-bye.